Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, the first in a series of virtual events that the Center on Global Energy Policy is hosting as a partner on domestic and international policy for this year's Climate Week, NYC. My name is Jason Bordoff. I'm the founding director of the Center on Global Energy Policy here at Columbia and a professor of practice at Columbia SEPA. Today, we are going to have a discussion about the impacts of the energy transition on global health and economic prosperity. And I just wanna start by noting that the questions we're going to discuss today of energy access and the health impacts of our energy choices and the impacts of, as well as the solutions to the urgent challenge of climate change have important implications for equity and justice around the world. And I just wanted to note that this weekend we lost a historic figure in this country's fight for equality and for justice, particularly on issues of gender, but many other issues of discrimination as well. I'd also note that Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg has long been a cherished member of the Columbia University community as an alumna of Columbia Law School and as the first female tenured member of the Columbia Law faculty. Like many of you, all of us at Columbia are remembering her legacy today and mourning her passing. So with that legacy as an inspiration, let's turn to our discussion today about the challenges of climate change and how the energy transition will impact globally public health and economic prosperity. And we have a really wonderful lineup of panelists to help us do that. Let me first quickly say that this event is being webcast live. The full video will be available on the Center on Global Energy Policy's website in the coming days. For those of you joining via Zoom, you can submit a question for the panelists at any time by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And for those of you watching the live stream anywhere else, you can submit questions via Twitter using the hashtag CGEPLive and our Twitter handle at ColumbiaUEnergy. For today's event, as I said, we have four excellent speakers who bring decades of experience. You can find their bios online. Uh, Martin Wetzler is the head of integrated gas and new energies at Shell. Uh, Mechtil Verstever is director of sustainability technology and outlooks at the International Energy Agency and a former director of the European Commission's Director General for Energy. Andrew Kamau is Principal Secretary for Petroleum, Ministry of Petroleum and Mining in the Republic of Kenya. And then our own Cheryl Lafleur, a distinguished visiting fellow this year at the Center on Global Energy Policy, joined us after her stint as the chair of FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Thanks to all of you for being with us. Before we get going with hearing from each of them for a couple of minutes and then getting into our discussion, we wanted to turn to all of you, our panelists, shortly um, to uh, ask a polling question and uh, see if we could set the table with one or two data points that may be relevant to the discussion we are about to have. So on your screen, you should see two questions. One, according to the International Energy Agency, how many people globally lack access to electricity today? And you can click on whichever one you believe to be the right answer. There's four choices. And then second, also according to the IEA, by 2040, Africa will be responsible for what share of cumulative global CO2 emissions? It's a bit of a trick question because it has the word cumulative in it, which is an important qualifier in the answer. So answer the question accordingly. And we'll wait a few more seconds for the answers to pile in. And we see in the first question, the correct answer. The majority view, the plurality view, I suppose, is 1.4 billion. The correct answer is 860 million. So we've made some progress in bringing that number down um, for lacking access to electricity, um, but still a very large number of people around the world. And then the second is 3% is the correct answer, um, which I think will come to some of what we will talk about today. Again, this is cumulative, so since around late 1800s, the total share of emissions that are attributable to the continent of Africa. When we keep that in mind, when we talk about the challenge of climate change, the responsibility for dealing with climate change and how to think about expanding access to energy and increasing levels of prosperity in Africa. 
So the correct answers are 860 million and 3%. So with that, let me uh, turn to our panelists and I'm gonna ask each of them to speak for a couple of minutes, three, four, five minutes to give some initial thoughts on the topic at hand. How do we think about where we are in the energy transition? What it means for global economic prosperity, access to energy, increasing living standards around the world and how to couple that and think about the complementarities and tensions with the challenge of climate change and also importantly, global public health. So with that, let me, uh, let me turn to the panelists. And Martin, let me start with you, please. Thanks, Jason. And good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to everybody who has dialed in today. It's a real pleasure to uh, be with the Columbia crew again and to um, discuss such an important topic, which is impossible to cover in a few minutes, of course. But um, I want to talk a little bit about transitions. Before, but before that, I'll just introduce myself. So Martin Metzler, I run Shell's uh, gas and new energies business. And in that um, uh, role, I'm also responsible for our energy access business, where we have a, a, a target to take 100 million people out of energy poverty by the end of this decade. So hopefully re playing our role in reducing the 860 million you saw in the uh, Q&A uh, in, in, in the polling um, just a minute ago. We can talk about that later. Um, but a few words about transitions, because we've, we've had a few, of course. Throughout history, um, we've seen transitions to different energy systems. And all these transitions have come with great improvements to, for mankind. In the 19th century, coal made the industrial revolution possible, creating prosperity around the world. Then in the 20th century, Oil made fast transport across the world possible, creating freedom. But of course, as we well know, these transitions have had negative consequences. And so today we are in urgent need of yet another transition, one to low carbon energy, to help tackle climate change. And again, that's a transition that can come with great improvements, creating a sustainable environment for the world to live in, whilst keeping the prosperity and the freedom that the previous two transitions brought. But improvements like these do not happen automatically. We have to make them possible together. And I think there are three simple things that we must all do to ensure that transition happens. First is to find opportunities to avoid emissions. These opportunities tend to lie in, in the many ways to, to power processes and products with low carbon electricity from solar and wind and even hydrogen electrifying anything that moves and then powering it with green electricity. Second, for those processes and products that cannot use electricity, that can't work without more traditional fuels, we have tremendous opportunity to reduce emissions. Think of greater energy efficiencies, build better building isolation, but also the development of technologies such as advanced biofuels to blend them into our fuels and make them lower carbon. So it's avoiding emissions and then reducing emissions. And then thirdly, for those emissions that the world really can't avoid or reduce, we have to offset these emissions. You can think of sectors that can't be easily or, for, or affordably electrified yet, like the production of steel or cement or chemicals or transport modes like planes or ships or heavy trucks. These sectors need to get to zero as well. And initially, certainly they will need to offset their emissions. For example, by re reducing greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, by protecting and working with nature, such as planting trees. We do believe that nature-based solutions have a significant role to play in achieving Paris in a timely way. But we can also think of car capturing and storing carbon, removing the CO2 from the atmosphere and storing it away safely. In all these three areas, the opportunities are big and the world will have to take all three of them if it's going to tackle climate change. And we can all start working together on that today. But the word together is important here. You need governments and regulators, NGOs and universities, and companies and consumers to all synchronize their efforts to work together to take these three steps, avoid emissions when we can, reduce them where they can't be avoided, them, and offset whatever emissions are left. That's the program for the next 30 years to get to zero fast. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Martin. Um, Andrew, let me go to you, please, uh, next. 
Uh, thanks so much, uh, Jason. It's always uh, good to be on this uh, on this platform. I think one of the um, the things that worries me about this whole energy transition and um, climate change, <clears throat> global warming, I think it's too academic. You know, we we've known all the things. You know, we we've known about carbon capture. We've known about um, hydrocarbons. We've known about transition. But to be honest with you, I, I don't see it. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not feeling it. Um, there's a lot of stories, ESG um, funds saying they're not gonna fund hydrocarbons anymore. Um, but on the ground, things are completely different. You know, um, if, if, you, if, you, if you think about it, what's the, what's the goal? The goal is two degrees. What does it mean? I mean, I, I, I can't quantify. Does it mean, um, 10 less coal power plants. If we get to 10, then we are two degrees. If we, if we don't do solar, it's gonna be, you know, we don't know what it is. I mean, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to put your finger on it. So because of that, I don't think that we, the, the urgency is there. Um, we were talking about this last week and we, you, you look at what's happening in California, in Oregon and these places with these fires. Yes, if you live there, it's, it's directly impacts you. But if you live, um, for example, in The Hague, how does that impact you directly? If you live in Africa, of course, it's, you can see the changes are there because of the weather. Um, we, for example, in Kenya, our main source of, of electricity is, even though we are 70% renewables, it's hydro, geothermal, wind, and solar. That's the main thing. But because of global warming, of course, we have longer drought seasons and we have, it, it impacts our ability to generate power from, from, um, from hydro. If you say that there has been reduced uh, investment in oil and gas, so that means drilling, um, there are more geologists who are out of work and that sort of thing, the same kind of skills you need for oil and gas are the same skills you need for, for geo for geothermal. We're not seeing any increased uh, interest from hedge funds, from different kinds of funders to say, look, since we're not spending this money on oil exploration, let's work on geothermal exploration. Same skills, same equipment. That's not happening, yeah? And you ask yourself, why, is it, why isn't this happening? If you look about next door to us, we have the Congo River. There's been this whole story of this dam that's going to be built on the Congo, has 40,000 megawatts of, of power. I, I dealt with it in uh, 2005 when we did the rehabilitation of, of, of the dam. And that story has been around for a long time. People have known about it. That's 40,000 megawatts on the African continent you can take out from, from uh, hydrocarbon fossil fuels in one go. That's not happening. Well, it's not happening anytime soon. So these are the things that we, we need to think about um, what, are, what are a clear set of priorities? Are, are we really serious about energy transition? Are we really serious about, um, uh, about global warming? Or oh, it's just going to be another nice talk shop. Uh, I'm always happy to come to New York, by the way, Jason, I'm not complaining. Uh, but is it going to be something? So we have to look at um, with all the transitions that have happened um, that, that Martin has spoken about, it's been economic. It's been driven by economics. It's more efficient. People are going to make money. They're going to solve uh, economic issues. But with global warming, it's, it's existential. Yeah? If, if really that's what it is, it's no longer economic. Um, some people are going to have to suffer. I remember one energy minister at one conference uh, said, that uh, the West would like Africa to uh, breathe fresh air in the dark, you know? So uh, talking about, we've got large um, deposits of, of hydrocarbons, we've got large deposits of coal, we would like to use our large deposits of coal, but concessions have to be made uh, somewhere. I think on, on the health issue, um, most of the people I would say 80% of the Kenyan population are cooking with charcoal and, and firewood. Now that's a serious issue because you're talking about 
20,000 uh, deaths due to respiratory diseases every single year. And it's mainly women because they're the ones who are taking care of uh, food production. We are trying to move them away to, um, to, to gas um, where they can then mimic the way they buy on a daily basis these commodities of wood and, and, and charcoal. And again, it's technology um, that's going to have to play a role there. So we have a very, very daunting task ahead of us. Um, like Martin said, um, cement is one of those things that we, we have to look at. Uh, we are moving in this country from building 10,000 houses a year to 100,000 houses a year. Uh, currently, so that means we have to do 10 times as much cement, 10 times as much steel. All this is going to be fossil fuel uh, driven. So I think we've, we've got a big task ahead of us and we really need to think about where we're going to make the concessions and what needs to be done going forward. I think I'll leave it there and then we, we can chat on the other stuff on Q&A. That's great. Thank you, Andrew. That's great remarks. And, and of course, you know, you're always welcome in, in New York. And in fact, you were supposed to be one of our speakers in April at our annual Columbia Global Energy Summit. And uh, unfortunately, that's how long, it feels like a long time ago, but this is how long we've been in this pandemic situation, that event was canceled. I think the comments you make are really important about this, do we have the sense of urgency around climate change and are we serious and talking seriously about what is required for a transition? And uh, I, I, I wrote something recently with a, I do a column in Foreign Policy Magazine. This is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day in this country. And on the first Earth Day in 1970, when one out of every 10 Americans came into the streets, basically across partisan lines, across uh, urban and suburban, to sort of say, we can't live like this anymore. We can't have air we can't breathe and water we can't drink or swim in. And policymakers have to do something about it. And, and the level of urgency around climate is certainly growing. It's very different in the polling today than just even a few years ago. But I'm not sure we're at that point yet. And as you point out, a very helpful perspective, it's, it's very different in different parts of the world. And how it looks in the US or Europe may not be the same in, in many other parts of the world. Um, and, and, and it's a good transition to Mechtil because the, uh, the IEA recently, you know, has told us a little bit of what's required that we talk a lot about not building new coal plants, but, but, but even if we never build a new, a, a new one, if we run the existing fleet to the end of their normal economic lifespans, we blow through the goals in the Paris agreement, the recent technology perspectives, uh, report that, that showed that to get to net zero by 2050, fully half of the cumulative emission reductions come from technologies that are not commercially available yet. That's a pretty powerful statistic. So can you talk a little bit about this issue and what you see, your perspective and what you see in terms of what the energy transition looks like? So thank you very much, uh, Jason. And I'm very glad to be at least uh, virtually with you. I was last year in New York for the Climate Week and it was obviously another completely other setting uh, similar events, but much more personally and people oriented. So I'm happy to join you. And just to say how different the year is, is not only that we meet physically, but we have done a lot of uh, assessment how this economic crisis, this health crisis has impacted the energy sector. And I think um, we are still kind of everywhere uh, living through that pandemic. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure this impact will uh, be with us. So we have done some work on, on the impact of that health crisis on the energy sector. And we expect a lower demand of five to 6% of energy, but we also expect 20% less investments uh, uh, overall and uh, seven to 8 percent of less CO2 emissions. And one question is here, obviously, this is temporary and how can we make that structural? And I think the Previous speakers um, mentioned that as well. So in order to make that structural, I see a chance now, even though I, I would agree we speak about clean energy transition since a while, but we have done, and a lot of countries are taking that up now, recovery plans. So we spend, a lot of governments spend millions, trillions of money in the economic recovery and stimulus party uh, projects. And we see more and more that energy and climate is part of it. It's different according to the regions. The EU announced a major 750 billion program and say 30 to 35% will be spent to climate related measures. And that uh, in all sectors, it's not only the energy sector, it's transport industry and so on. 
So I think there is a chance, and we looked at the IA on the sustainable recovery plan, which could create jobs, which could help the growth of the economy, but also reduce CO2 emissions. And in short, we see with, with the possibilities we have and looking at the 9 trillion, which are in recoveries right now, that we could get a new job creation every year, 9 uh, billion in, in, in three years, and that we could also maybe have a peak in emissions. So there's a new momentum. I mean, it's a crisis, obviously, it's not what we wanted, but there is a lot of uh, chances and opportunities right now if the governments take that further on. And there are signals, at least, as you mentioned, uh, Jason, in, in the US and Europe and some other parts, and we have to bring everybody along. And uh, looking at the possibilities, I, I would join also uh, Martin there, not everything can be done by electrification. We have looked at that. Uh, there is uh, some hard to date sectors and you mentioned it, the ETP we just launched uh, where, I mean, it's a very ambitious innovation scenario to get net zero globally by 2050. But in that indeed, half of the um, uh, technologies are really in early stages. So what can be helped in that uh, recovery program is also to scale up, scale up electrolyzers for hydrogen, scale up batteries, scale up CCS, CCU, which I agree has been an issue for the last 20 years, uh, up and down. The UK, US was, had a, a tax incentive, Europe was slow, others were slow. But we see a momentum here as well. And by the way, on Thursday, we come up with a major report on CCS, CCU, uh, including all technologies, including direct air capture, everything around for every kind of uh, segment uh, industry. But that's why I think the momentum is there. If we crap it, if we see companies, BP, Shell, and others moving in that direction, we see governments moving in that direction uh, and, and finance investors as well, to be honest. Um, and let me just maybe conclude because I, I liked your two questions because uh, came out of the IEA studies, but also uh, seeing that Africa and uh, Andrew mentioned that there are still 860 million people without uh, access. So uh, we have done this access tracking since 10, 12 years at the IEA. It was two years ago, 1 billion. So it's slowly getting down, but in Africa, it's still a very much an issue in the Sub-Saharan Africa and so on. So this is something we should reflect and in our sustainable development scenario, access is the key issue and air pollution. So if it's not climate change who's driving the clean energy transition, there is a need for clean access and access to ele clean electricity and air pollution is another driver in many other parts, even in Paris, but certainly more in some of the bigger capitals where we, we experience that. So there is a lot uh, on a momentum, I would say, uh, in hopefully in all part, but we have to be aware that it's really a just transition that everyone takes it on, including in countries, but also globally between developed and developing countries. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. And and the number we showed, of course, that 860 million, which, as I said, has come down, was only electricity. A much larger number does not have access to clean cooking uh, uh, facilities, as as you note at the IEA, and and that has important public health, very important public health implications uh, as well. Um, we can come back to that. Uh, and I'm interested in your perspective too. You sort of said we see momentum with the IOCs, with policymakers, with finance community, and um, you know, I see Andrew was a little more skeptical about whether we're really seeing momentum. And I want to come back and sort of see how that plays out in different parts of the world. I think those perspectives are really interesting. But Cheryl, let me turn to you first. Thank you, Jason. I'm really happy to be part of this panel with such distinguished colleagues. I'm primarily going to speak about the topics from a U.S. perspective. As I reflect where we are, I start from the proposition that the United States has not accomplished as much as it's capable of in reducing uh, greenhouse gases and addressing climate change. While the US has made some progress, particularly in substituting natural gas generation for coal generation and making electricity and significant construction of wind and solar <clears throat> generation, the US has certainly not made progress proportional to the threat that the 
climate issue poses here in the US, let alone to our share of contributing to the global issue. I wanna talk a little bit about why I think that is and how we can use the historic moment we're in now to maybe jumpstart our efforts. The main reason we haven't made progress in the US as much as we could, I believe is a lack of societal and political consensus here that climate change is a problem, leading to a lack of an organized national response. While more than two thirds of Americans say in polls that they believe the US should do more, many, you know, a third do not, including those from states that are heavily reliant on fossil fuels to power their economies. Of course, as everyone knows, this is part of a larger political polarization in the US with the current presidential administration not only opposing further climate response, but actively rescinding the hard won progress we had started to make in the Obama administration. The upcoming presidential election in the US gives us an opportunity for a reset, though it's likely that whatever happens, the battle lines will be drawn in a different place. Because of the lack of a national response, most climate response in the United States and most renewable energy investment is being driven at the state level, state by state, with nearly half of US states, including some of the most populous, setting carbon reduction targets. This is not as effective, in my opinion, as a national target or a national response strategy because the response is disaggregated and inconsistent and states do not control within their borders the infrastructure or the markets they need <clears throat> to deliver on their strategies. Another problem in the U.S. is the difficulty of building infrastructure, including major renewable energy projects and the transmission to connect them to population centers. And I very much agree with what Andrew said, that there's a mismatch between people's expressed political support for doing something about climate change and their willingness to actually change their own actions, such as to have facilities built near them, which is very difficult, even in regions of the country that express strong political support for or cleaner energy. So into this situation comes the COVID-19 pandemic and the historic economic downturn that it's caused, including here in the US. And there's an old cliche, never let a good crisis go to waste. The fact that we need <clears throat> national legislation to stimulate the US economy definitely provides an opportunity for focused spending to address climate change that'll help create jobs to restore the economy and contribute to the public health, first of all, by reducing long-term climate change, but also all the co-benefits of making electricity and powering transportation and other sectors more cleanly. Federal stimulus legislation and related energy or infrastructure legislation could include, first of all, more spending on and reform of siting of interstate high voltage transmission and location constrained renewables like onshore and offshore wind. This has been talked about as part of an infrastructure package that people on both sides of the aisle in the US claim they want. Um, it's needed both <coughs> to carbonize current electricity use and to build a better base of how we make our electricity to allow electrification of the transportation and heating sectors. And of course it would create jobs, primarily construction jobs. Secondly, more spending on energy efficiency. The International Energy Agency report said that retrofitting homes and businesses for more efficient energy use is the number one job creator. Their service jobs not tied to a specific geography of where the wind is the strongest or where fossil fuels are in the ground. So they're a very good economic engine. Third, focused economic attention on communities and regions and states that are facing job losses because of the lower utilization of fossil fuels, especially coal miners and coal power plant workers. This is a very important part of Vice President Biden's climate response plan. And if handled correctly, I, it could help get climate cautious states on board with some <coughs> infrastructure spending for energy and climate response. And finally, more spending on research and development of new technologies, particularly um, carbon-free balancing generation, controllable generation we can use to balance the wind and solar as it's built out, whether it's carbon capture and storage, hydrogen, as well as technology solutions for the hard to address industrial and heavy transportation sectors. 
And my Columbia colleagues have just released a report on energizing America, really calling for the ways in which federal R&D spending that could be part of a stimulus package could help power an innovation economy. So in short, in my opinion, in the US, we have a problem. We haven't done enough about it, but we have an opportunity to address that problem if we can summon the political will and act. Thank you, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. That's great framing remarks. Thanks. There's such a rich and varied set of topics and perspectives to talk about. Uh, I want to spend 90 minutes with with each of you. <laughs> we can maybe do that on our, our weekly podcast. Um, uh, but but let me start, maybe Andrew, go back to you and respond a little bit to what McTilde said, and then maybe Martin after that. I mean, we talk a lot about an energy transition. And just a level set, I want to sort of get a sense for where we are and whether there's an energy transition underway. You you see uh, a need in Kenya, and, and to the extent you feel you can speak about the continent more broadly, to expand access to energy. We heard about those staggering numbers of people who lack access to electricity and to clean cooking. There are projects in Kenya, uh, controversial ones, we can talk about those later, around coal to develop oil resources, uh, and also a lot of opportunity to expand uh, low and zero carbon energy and a lot of progress being made. Do you see, um, do you see uh, uh, any pullback in, 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 or shift in the outlook where investment and capital is going? Uh, and, and how do we, how do, how, do we, how do we square the challenges of, you know, I think the projection is between now and 2040, one out of every two people added to the planet will be African. That's a lot of people and that's a lot of energy. Uh, how do we make sure they have the energy they need for rising levels of prosperity and deal with the public health and climate challenges we've been talking about? Okay, Jason, I think there, there are two issues. You know, one of them, of course, is um, the energy poverty that you spoke about from a household level. That's easier to solve because you know you've got uh, mini grids and all sorts of things which we've put in place, uh, where we are distributing generation. Because, um, like Cheryl said, we have similar problems like the the U.S. in terms of interstate transmission lines, growing uh, regional power pools. Yeah, I mean our our, our distances are very large. Uh, they are vast. Uh, um, it's a vast continent. So if you're going to move from one country to the other, it's, it's, it's hundreds of kilometers of transmission lines. So if you don't have that, you have to then gen generate closer to the source. Um, do you want a, um, a, a large wind farm near you? Um, right now, I, I don't think there's been much of a problem. Uh, we've got one in the north of Kenya, which is 350 megawatts, which is the largest on the continent. And we have one near my parents' house, um, which is, I think, 80 or thereabouts. But I think, I think that's, that's at a household level because household consumption is not that big right now. You have lighting, uh, a few low, low uh, voltage, uh, low wattage appliances. I think the part that we really need to be careful about is the industrial side of it. Um, like I said earlier, we... <clears throat> If you look at the per capita consumption of cement in Kenya since 1990 to now, it has grown 260%. Yeah, you, I heard one, one, uh, one company was saying that their cement growth was growing at 13% per annum. So you compound that. And it's not only here, it's, it's everywhere on the continent because you, you, you now have to have affordable housing. Everyone is demanding a better life. So if we don't look, if we don't keep an eye on what's going on in Africa, that 3% cumulative will balloon into something that we, we can't understand because it's only 3%. It's no big deal. It's okay. Yeah? Uh, what will happen is that you will have large, uh, like you said, you know, there's controversial projects like the coal-fired power plant in Lamu, um, which we, we are re-looking at but you have a thousand megawatts of coal. All of a sudden, that's just one plant. Uh, then you have a, another thousand of gas. You have, they just keep adding. You know, you've got Zimbabwe, they've got big coal deposits. They put up a thousand megawatts. Everyone puts up three, 4,000 megawatts in each country. And all of a sudden, it's no longer the, 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 the number that we thought. Maybe small cumulatively, 
But you know, you, we are at the tipping point where every addition makes a big difference. Yeah? And, and this is the problem that, that we're in because we have to balance uh, the whole issue of economic growth and prosperity with climate change. <clears throat> and that's the trade-off. And, and, and it's a political issue because, uh, you know, people want electricity. Kenya, for example, we had 22% connectivity in 2013. We now have 70% connectivity, but it's been a serious political push. It costs money because the people you're connecting don't have the appliances. They have a light bulb. They have a, so the cost of connecting them outweighs the economic cost, but you have to for economic and political reasons. Thank you so much. And um, some some viewers may have joined late. So I'll just for those watching online, remind everyone that my name is Jason Bordoff. I'm here with our four panelists, Martin Wetzler, the head of Integrated Gas and New Energies at Shell, Mechtel Verstever, the Director of Sustainability, Technology and Outlooks at the IEA, Andrew Kamau, who you just heard from, who's the Principal Secretary for Petroleum in the Ministry of Petroleum and Mining in Kenya, and then Cheryl Lafleur, the former chair of FERC and a distinguished visiting fellow here at the Center on Global Energy Policy. And again, for those um, who, who missed it at the beginning, uh, we're going to talk for a bit and then we'll open it up to questions for those joining on Zoom. You can submit a question for the panelists at any time by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And for those watching the live stream anywhere else, you can submit a question on Twitter using the hashtag CGEP live and our Twitter handle at Columbia U Energy. Uh, let's return to the discussion. Martin, if you could pick up on what Andrew said and talk about the role of the IOCs in meeting this challenge. And there's an article even in, in the New York Times today about the IOCs are not all necessarily in the same place. There's important differences uh, potentially across the Atlantic that some people point to. Shell has leaned in, I think it's fair to say, to talk about uh, what it looks like to be a different kind of company in 2050 and to... Um, <clears throat> bring down uh, the greenhouse gas intensity uh, 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 of the company and uh, and diversify into electricity, into renewable energy, into charging and other, other businesses. How do you think about the role IOCs need to play in, in, in be potentially becoming different kinds of companies to meet our Paris climate goals, but then the perspective you just heard about what the reality of rising energy demand is around the world? How do we meet that? Yeah, thanks, uh, Jason. Um, a big topic. Um, so, what do I think about that? Uh, you know, we, we have set a um, uh, an ambition to be a net zero energy b uh, business by 2050. So that's what I think about it. I think that every energy company in the world should have that ambition, and not just have the ambition, because a lot of people have ambitions, but should actually put their money where their mouth is and start to um, invest in the technologies required. But many of these technologies are of a maturity where you can actually already roll them out and build wind farms, build solar um, farms um, uh, and, and deploy integrated systems to start replacing where possible um, some of the um, CO2 heavy uh, sources of the energy demand by CO2 light or even CO2 free um, source of energy supply. So. I'm, uh, I think it's, it's absolutely necessary for the industry to change, and I don't think it's changing fast enough um, in, any, uh, in any way, and I don't think we're changing fast enough. Um, we're still developing momentum towards an ambition rather than to say we have an exact plan to get there. Um, but, but, I do uh, but I do think there is momentum, uh, that, that, that part of, parts of the world have reached a tipping point where, where it's now just about the how, not whether we, we will go there. Um, uh, if you look at indeed what's happening in the EU, I think it's pretty groundbreaking. Um, but also China and also parts of the US. I agree with Cheryl that the US as a federation, as a federal system hasn't done enough. But you see, if you look at California, uh, uh, what's happening there is actually a lot of, um, uh, a lot of action. And I'll give you a, a small example, although I hope it will become a big example. Um, in 1992, um, we started Shell Hydrogen because we believed in the future of hydrogen as a vector in the energy system. And it's reliably lost money for the last 28 years because there wasn't a lot of interest in the world in hydrogen, particularly in, in clean hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen, of course, part of industrial processes, but not as a major uh, vector in the energy system. Um, 
And so we could easily have given up hope and maybe we should have uh, 20 years ago. Um, but, but if you look around you today, the amount of public interest, and this is indeed a bit Europe uh, focused, uh, France, Germany, EU, but also China, where, where there's a lot of spent on hydrogen, Australia, California. If I add together the budgets that have been announced to promote hydrogen, um, the, the problem won't be, won't be money anymore. It will simply be the program to actually spend it wisely. Um, and, and I do believe that is an example of where, where, where a tipping point has been reached. Um, and I do also believe that it is exactly these geographies, the developed world, the wealthy world, that needs to take charge here and, and, uh, and, and really take these technologies down the cost curve. It's not for sub-Saharan Africa to take electrolysis down the cost curve. Let the West do it. And in five years time, it can be down the cost curve to the point that it actually becomes economically um, um, competitive, maybe 10 years. And when it becomes economically competitive, you know, mass deployment into Africa, into India, into the places that need it. But um, so I think there's a bit of a moral imperative there um, for, the, for the EU, for the US, for China, Australia, to, and parts of South, uh, Southeast Asia to lead the way. And if I look at what happens in hydrogen, if you see the speed at with which offshore wind is now being built out, I don't think that momentum will turn around. I actually, I don't even think it's linear. I think it's exponential. And that gives me the hope to still say, in spite of the inadequacies of everybody in this space, the inadequacies of governments, of regulators, of companies, and of consumers, all of us, we still have a chance to meet, to, to meet Paris and to actually get to 1.5 degrees because it is at some point going to be exponential and we might well be on the tipping point. And for us, it's about, I don't see this as a contribution to a better world. I see it as, as survival. If we want to be a relevant energy company by 2050, we'd better be in the low carbon business because the high carbon products won't sell anymore. Um, uh, and and so, so I see this as existential rather than, uh, let's say, uh, uh, being a force for good. Now, if you can be both at the same time, all the better. Um, and I, the last point I would say, there is a wall of money available to invest in this, but we don't quite yet have the business models, the value chains and the technologies lined up in a way for this to click. If I could promise you know, a hydrogen highway in Europe tomorrow with all the hydrogen available competitively for all the trucks in Europe to go on hydrogen, I'm sure this will be paid. But we don't quite have it together yet to, to deploy this at large scale, but we're close. And, uh, and if these things start to click, I, I, I don't think actually investor money and subsidy money will be the issue. Um, um, so so I'm, I'm optimistic, but I don't underestimate what it will take to do it in these geographies and then to roll it out across the world. It is the biggest challenge the world has faced in a long time. Um, just a quick follow-up, and then I want to bring Mathilde and, and Cheryl in and, and talk about, well, a little bit the question I have for you, which is the role of policy and how far out ahead a company like Shell can or, or will get. You know, you talk about hydrogen and it's more expensive than uh, alternatives today and doing it in a blue way or a green way is more expensive than not. So, so, so policy, I think, has to come along in order to make those investments work economically. Um, and, and many countries, as you know today, are, 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 there's a gap between the ambition and the rhetoric and what the actual policy is and whether we're on track to meet our Paris goals. So if you agree with that, tell me if you do, what does that mean for how you think about how far uh, a company like Shell um, is, is able to push and, and, and maybe what it means for the industry more broadly? Is it how much can we expect that they would move into these areas if, if policy is not there to make sure that you can capture returns on those investments? Yeah, I, think, I mean, it's iterative, of course. I don't think it's good enough for the industry to hold back and say, as long as the policy isn't in place, as long as the incentives aren't there, I'm going to just mind my own business. Um, that, that I don't think is good enough. Uh, the industry needs to invest itself in R&D and it needs to start to experiment at some scale with these solutions. Because otherwise, how can a policymaker decide what is the right level of incentivization if there is no business, no prototypes to look at? So it is iterative, I believe. Um, and, uh, and absolutely, there are areas where you can, uh, you can talk about policymakers being slow or being perhaps um, uh, difficult to predict. 
uh, and sometimes even uh, turning things around. And, th and that will slow things down. Uh, but I don't think the industry is currently at a point where, where, the, where, where it has the moral authority to blame the regulators for the lack of progress. I think it's a joint, um, a, a, a joint issue to be tackled. And I do feel the, urgent, uh, the urgency is there. So I think companies can get ahead of the music. Not too far, you know, we've clearly spent too much on hydrogen in the last 30 years, and there's a risk we don't spend enough in it in the next few years. So I'm, I'm here to make sure we don't make that second mistake. I wasn't always there to, to, for, for, to avoid the first one. So you can get ahead of things a little bit, but at some point, yeah, regulators need to step up. But interestingly, Jason, we also see a lot of voluntary adoption. So in lots of states in the US where companies don't have to procure clean energy, they do it anyway. We, we, we sell clean power to large data centers in the US in areas where they will be welcome to take coal-fired power. But they don't do it. They pay me a premium to build a solar plant to give them clean power and to give them hydrogen in the backup. And they pay an even larger premium for that. So there is also quite a bit of voluntary take up uh, along consumers and companies of this. And that's, of course, this, the business you start serving early until the regulators catch up and, and put in the mandates, put in the carbon prices to make this part of the mainstream. Would you would you like to see the industry doing and spending more to lobby and advocate for stronger climate policy? Yeah, I think the industry absolutely should have it, make its voice heard, but it needs to be the right story, of course. You need to advocate uh, uh, for, for the right outcomes there. Um, but, but, but absolutely, um, that voice needs to be heard more, uh, more, more loudly and clearly, because eventually, um, uh, Jason, what, what comes out of the policy and regulatory machine needs to be practical. And this is often where industry can actually, industry's voice is important. We need to be able to execute. Mechtel, there's, you put out this wonderful report at the IEA about, about green recovery. And I want to ask you how, uh, how we're doing. What do you see around the world? Is, is policy moving in that direction? Do, and, and how big an opportunity is the need for recovery and stimulus to kind of catal help catalyze some of the investments uh, that we need? And then maybe talk a little bit about the European Union in particular, which I think it's fair to say is probably furthest ahead and has some pretty, has announced some big plans, including in the area of hydrogen, for example. Thank you very much. Um, I think for, for the big recovery plans and the, what, what it will definitely and in reality bring, it's, it's probably a bit early to say. But what we did uh, in our sustainable uh, recovery plan, we advised governments to take up some measures. And we looked at uh, low carbon electricity. We looked a lot at energy efficiency, transport, uh, innovation and technology. and what we basically said, if governments would invest uh, uh, $1 trillion a year globally, we could create jobs and we could also peak uh, in 2019. And there is a lot, a lot of details. And I think Cheryl already uh, mentioned that we see, for example, 35% of that job creation in the energy field in, in energy efficiency in the reno renovation of buildings, in appliances, in other means. 25% in low carbon um, electricity, wind and solar and smart grids. So this could bring jobs. And I think the governments, uh, if there's one common fe uh, feature, uh, if they're more climate minded or less climate minded, everyone is in a difficult situation right now. So they want to boost the economy, they want to create jobs and they have to create jobs. So if that can be combined, and that's the whole idea of our sustainable recovery plan, that we have energy efficiency measures, that we have electric vehicles incentives, that we have innovation and technology R&D stepping up, we contracyclical with some governments are doing, then we can create jobs, then we can boost the economy, and then we can, we can also uh, have a peak in the emissions. But I think the, the policy and government's role uh, remains absolutely key. I mean, uh, there are, I think, 125 governments who announced uh, low carbon strategies, but there are only 10, around 10 plus the EU, who are putting that in law. So I would fully agree there's a lot of announcement. The next step, I think, is reached in a number of regions or countries is to put it in law and have really step by step what to do by 25, 30, 
40, 50. So it's, it's, it's becoming law plus measures plus a strategy plus money behind. So, and I think there we can see the first result. And now um, I, I, I can speak about the EU because I worked there 20 years. And when in 2014, we discussed the 30, 2030 targets for CO2 emissions, renewables, energy efficiency, there was a huge debate for CO2 emission reduction from 1990 to 2030 of going 35% uh, less of 40. Five years agree, they got uh, an agreement between the 28 at the stage uh, heads of states that we need to go down in Europe by 40% of CO2 emissions and 32% renewables and energy efficiency. Five years later, last week, the president of the European Commission announced a target of at least 55% CO2 emission reduction by 2030. So in five to six years, the optimism, the, the, sometimes we cannot see how fast it goes. We always think it, it goes too slow, but in some parts, and I think I quite believe that these targets and then broken down also for renewables energy efficiency, trigger investment made it happen in Europe. I saw it in Germany, I saw it in France, in the Netherlands, I, UK at the time, or still it, the targets and the obligation and the monitoring scheme and whatever is behind and the money and the commitment, both from governments and, and industry is certainly helping. And what we can learn also uh, from the crisis 2008, 2009, there had been a lot of mistakes done and CO2 emission rebound, but money, uh, governments who put money in solar and wind, which at the time, 2008, 9, was quite expensive still. They put money and we see now the drop in prices and offshore wind, uh, onshore wind and solar is becoming really competitive and cheap. So we see in, in our other work also, if we put money in hydrogen, because I agree it's, it's, it's everywhere you don't, it's, it's not only Europe, it's Japan, Australia, US, uh, many parts. Um, if we put uh, now money into the hydrogen electrolyzers or maybe in, in CCS technology because it's useful or necessary in some parts like cement, I fully agree and, and the example from Africa for the cement industry in Kenya and the boost in it, uh, I think we could help have the same experience if, if the money is put in the right uh, technologies to bring the cost down, we can see the benefits over the years uh, in these technologies, and that can help not only the developed world, but it should also spread out to the developing world. So I think there, the role of governments is absolutely key. I mean, and then they have to bring along everyone, but, uh, and there's the momentum because we can create job and, and drive the economy. And just wow. to be clear, when you say the role of government, it, it, it's beyond just spending. I mean, when you talk about emissions peaking, that spending can help bring that about faster, but you're still talking about a need for regulations, carbon prices, limits on pollution, some sort of regulatory tools, as well as government investment. Is that right? Absolutely. If you look at the announcement from the EU last week, there's a work program for the next two years, which is regulation, regulation. Uh, not all government might be excited about it, but there is a lot of detailed regulatory framework to make that happen. So targets is one thing, uh, measures uh, in, in energy efficiency, in, in renovation, uh, requirements for net zero buildings, new buildings, and the renovation rate for existing buildings. I mean, there's a lot of, of quite a strong regulatory framework which is needed. Yeah. Cheryl, let me uh, ask you to kind of give a perspective here from, from the US where you know, climate change is playing a much larger role in the presidential election, certainly on the Democratic side of the aisle this time than I think we have in, in previous uh, elections. The Vice President Biden has a, a very ambitious goal to de de decarbonize electricity by 2035. Um, but, but you know how difficult it is to actually uh, pass things through Congress and use the regulatory tools uh, that exist uh, with agencies like EPA or independent agencies like FERC. Um, what are the biggest drivers you think for, for th that we have available to us to, to move in that direction? And how do you think COVID-19 
will will affect it? Is that going to make it harder or easier? Are we going to be sort of concerned with the economy? So things like this don't get as much attention, or is there really going to be an opportunity to talk about investment in the economy in a way that stimulates and catalyzes uh, the way you know the Recovery Act ten years ago did, but but on a bigger scale? That's a great question. I think I'll. I definitely think that despite the COVID challenges, and in some in some cases because of them, there's still an opportunity to act. Should there be a new administration, I would describe um, actions that the government, the federal government in the US can take to support climate response in three categories. The first are things that can be done by a new presidential administration, essentially by executive action. Um, our mutual colleague, Michael Gerard at Columbia Law School and his team have put out a list of things that the um, new president could do on day one, which really means like the first 100 days. For example, um, rejoining the Paris Accord on climate change does not require legislation. Um, putting back in place various efficiency standards that have been suspended, changing out certain things that the EPA has changed can be done should there be a new president without having to use legislative capital. Secondly, um, a new president would change out over time people at all the various regulatory agencies, which, you know, I'm a former regulator, so I believe they can really make a difference. Um, the EPA has been actively rescinding anything that helps climate change. If you had a new EPA administrator, new people on the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, a new outlook at the Council for Environmental Quality, um, and some of those require um, Senate approval, others do not, but the you could start putting in place people who at least are trying to row in the same direction to use the EPA as a direct environmental regulator, FERC as an economic regulator, but they could try to row in the same direction to help the state climate strategies and other things work. Um, the third and the hardest is um, legislation. Many people think, you know, in the first six months of a six months of a administration, you can get more done on legislation than later. A lot of this depends on what happens if there's a democratic Senate, but regardless of whether there's a democratic Senate, um, the question is what will the first thing that a new administration does out of the gate be? Probably something pretty squarely related to COVID and economic response. The question is how much climate can be in that? Is climate the second priority after the immediate crisis? Some people might think it's immigration or gun control. Um, legislation is hard to pass. I would hope we can get climate legislation, but I think in terms of executive action and agency action, even without legislation, you can start supporting the efforts of the states and uh, investing in innovation and other things that will help the effort. That's great. I, I don't want to go from the global perspective to to in the weeds to one particular uh, city or state, but but I think it's it's interesting because um, we talk about how quickly this transition needs to happen. Just that's that's climate math. You just sort of add up add up the tons, and and there's only so much room in the carbon budget. We got to move pretty quickly, and um, <clears throat> and there's a question about how quickly one one can move and what the challenges are in doing that. And as you know, because you wrote a paper a short uh, piece on it recently. Um, some have looked to uh, California recently and said, look, this is, this is the risk of moving too quickly with renewables. We see the challenges they had keeping the lights on. And so just comment on what you, your take is on what happened in California, but what, what broader lessons that applies and tells us about how, quick, how quickly can we move to decarbonize the electricity system, make the needed investments and deal with things like, uh, like uh, intermittency? Well, that's a great question. And I do not Spoiler alert, I don't think the answer is that California is going too fast. I think that the wind and solar that mostly solar, but some big wind projects that California has um, invested in performed well, but there are important lessons to learn. Um, the first is that California was had inadequate balancing resources for the solar and wind. Much of this is natural gas generation. It can be hydro. It can be other forms of, it can be storage in the future. Um, but 
California got rid of a lot of its balancing resources before the ones that were supposed to replace them had been put in place. And so it's a lesson for other states as they approach high levels of penetration of wind and solar to make sure that they have um, the resources to balance because wind and solar obviously are variable depending on uh, whether the sun is shining. And we pretty much know when it shines, uh, you know, that's not the sun, sunrise and sunset is right in the farmer's almanac. I don't know if that translates, but it's known years and ahead. Um, and when the wind is blowing. So um, most studies show you can get 75, 80% renewable penetration if you have enough to balance it. And California did not have enough. The second lesson from California is that we need more regional transmission so that there can be a sharing. The United States is blessed with four different time zones so that um, peaks are at different times and a lot of different weather patterns and resource zones. So if we build more transmission, that's another important enabler of more renewable generation. But I think I've said in my article that I think the California, certainly the rolling blackouts in mid-August are like a Rorschach test that people superimpose what they want to see. I think there's lessons to be learned in how to decarbonize, but the lesson is not that we should stop by any means. Thank you. Um, and I, I commend people to take a look at that piece, which is on our, our website at the Energy Center. Um, Andrew, let me turn to you. And I want to come back to the words um, public health uh, in the title uh, uh, of this session and sort of talk about Mechtel mentioned how it is not only climate, it's it's uh, air pollution and public health concerns that are playing a big role in driving this transition. And ha we, we talked about, for example, the coal project in Lamu, which is very controversial, and coal is not only a, a, an issue in, in global public health, in, in climate change, but also for for local air pollution. Talk about what you uh, what you see as the priorities for uh, for Kenya, and again, to the extent you can speak to the region more broadly. And um, how much of that <clears throat> is driven by the public health and air pollution concerns and what sort of solutions does that drive toward? There's a question from one viewer and we're just at the point now where I was gonna start incorporating some of the questions that are coming in. Again, people can submit those with Q&A. Uh, a viewer uh, in Ghana who uh, notes that there is going to, there's not one speed of transition and it's gonna take place differently in different parts of the world. And uh, Hamas Youssef, this viewer says, um, an inter, in, in, intermediate transition is happening very fast from liquid fuels to natural gas uh, in a place like Ghana, but the transition to renewables is is far slower. Uh, do you do you agree with that? And then you know that may have different implications for the different problems that that we're trying to solve. And I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, I think for for us, uh, well, on, on the east coast, for example, just like in, on the west coast of, of Africa. Gas is becoming more of a of a major um, transition fuel. Um, it's going to be the the big thing. Um, we are in discussion with our neighbors next door, which is Tanzania. They've got large gas deposits uh, to build a gas pipeline from from uh, Tanzania to 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 Mombasa in on the Kenyan coast. And I think, Jason, you know, one of the things that uh, there's economics involved in this, if, if that pipeline comes along and, um, you know, power generation starts happening in Mombasa through gas, the chances of building the coal fired power plant diminish. Yeah, because you've got some of this, we're not going to have to ship in the gas uh, on, on a vessel, it's coming in by pipeline, which is probably one of the cheapest ways to get it across. Coal on the other side will have to import from somewhere. So from an economics point of view, um, people just look at the, the returns on, on, on investment and they say, look, it's better we go with the, with the gas-fired power plant than the coal-fired power plant. Uh, because I think the returns that, that, that funders are looking at is between 15 and 20% uh, on IRR, which is not, it's not small. You know, so that's, that's one thing. And that, of course, helps... Um, air quality a lot, because one of the things that you will see what's happened in places like Mozambique in, in, in the capital, uh, Maputo, public transport is gas. It's moved away from being diesel to, to gas. And, and you know, those of you who've, who've traveled to many African uh, um, co um, capitals, these uh, trucks that are belching and, and buses that are belching uh, diesel fumes, they're there, they're everywhere. And you can see that the 
you know, the, the soot hanging over, 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 the, um, over the town, especially during rush hour. If we can do the same in, in, in Kenya with Tanzanian gas, then we can move, you know, transport away from, from, um, from, from diesel. Um, we already have a pipeline that comes from the coast up to Nairobi, which is 500 kilometers. And this is, uh, can be converted to a gas fire power plant, which goes into, um, into um, the cement plants that we spoke about. It goes into the, into the diesel fired power plants. The good thing about Kenya is our per purchase agreements say that if the government makes gas available to you, you must move away from heavy fuel oil and from, from diesel. So again, helping, uh, helping emissions, emissions there. I talked about um, you know wood and charcoal. Um, you know we're running pilots right now on uh, LPG. So you have these prepaid meters um, that run on on the gas bottles, and you you we're one of the leaders in mobile money. So it actually has a a, a pneumatic valve. So when you put the money into the SIM card, it meters out the exact amount of gas for the money that you put in. So you only pay for what you use, which is more efficient than charcoal. Because once, once you start a charcoal fire, it burns all the way to the end. You can't stop it halfway. So it's about efficiencies. And this is a serious public health issue for, for, for us, not only in Kenya, but for everywhere on, on, on the continent where all of us are trying to add forest cover one of the things that we're trying to move forest cover from 7% to 10% in Kenya. And we really need to spend some money in giving people alternatives and viable alternatives. Uh, one of the things that uh, we spoke about COVID and I, I agree with Cheryl, it's, it's really not much to do with, 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 with the COVID uh, issue. And we've, um, we've put together a, a recovery plan, the COVID re recovery plan. And one of the things that we're going to do next year is go out and issue a green bond. The problem has been when African countries issue green bonds, the tenure is very short. It's five to seven years. Um, people are looking at seven to ten percent return, which is if you if you really think about. And this is why I said, are we really serious about climate change? People should be gone and say, look, we are serious about climate change. We are prepared to do fifteen year tenure on the bond and will probably charge one or 2%. Then I can say there's momentum. But until that happens, it's a commercial deal. You know, it may as well be coal, it may as well be gas. You know, there is no, there is no difference uh, on, on, on these issues. Martin, let me give you a chance to comment uh, on that. Um, particularly, or I don't need to tell you that the outlook for <clears throat> gas looks different in different parts of the world and the degree of controversy about the role of gas in the energy transition is different in different parts of the world. And, and I, I put it this way, I, I have, I've heard the question asked and let me just give you a chance to, to respond to it. I've heard people ask, how is it the case that Shell is both committed to net zero by 2050 and has an LNG outlook in which gas and LNG demand continues to grow quite quickly for, for a while. And how does that just kind of work with the carbon budget we have left? So can you comment on that and respond to some of what Andrew talked about? Yeah, th thanks, Jason. And th the good news is it's entirely consistent. And it's actually reinforcing. Um, it, and uh, I just want to endorse what Andrew was saying uh, uh, about the, the effect that indeed um, switching coal to natural gas can have um, on the, in a number of areas. So Cheryl said earlier that the main progress that's been made in the United States has been phasing coal out and substituting it by natural gas, which has actually allowed the country to be on a pretty acceptable CO2 trajectory over the last few years. Not very policy related, it was more economics, but it worked. Um, if you go to Beijing, uh, as I frequently used to do before COVID, um, the air is pretty clean now. Uh, that's because there's no coal-fired power left in any, within any of the rings of Beijing. It's all been uh, replaced by gas. Big CO2 benefit, but indeed also a very big uh, air quality benefit to the policy, the, to the people of Beijing. I think during COVID, even the good people of New Delhi had blue skies. 
And, and do, do you really think they want to go back to a world where they couldn't see the other side of the street because of all the diesel and coal um, uh, related air pollution? Absolutely not. So I think, so my sense is, and our sense is, the political imperative, particularly in Asia and Africa, to some degree also in Latin America, to make sure that air quality now, you know, com is fixed continuously post-COVID, um, is, I believe, enormous. And, and the, the gas industry and LNG industry will need to play a big part in this. Obviously, you displace coal not only with natural gas, you displace it with natural gas plus renewables. But it needs to be done in an intelligent mix. So you keep your power system supplied, you keep your grid secure and stable. Um, and that's where the combination of the two uh, come in. That's where I um, uh, enjoy seeing the comment from Ghana. I've lived in Ghana um, uh, uh, twice. Um, and uh, it used to be quite a hydro uh, 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 hydropower uh, supplied electricity system. But um, nowadays, actually, the natural gas is indeed in there. And we are proud to be the supplier of the energy to, to Ghana since last year. But, but, but the point is, uh, once you make um, and, you know, affordable energy and relatively clean energy abundantly available to a country like that. And the same will happen in Mombasa. Um, economic activity, there's so much suppressed demand for energy in these places. Economic activity will come, uh, will follow. And then you actually generate the money to make it sustainable and to go even lower carbon natural gas, which is obviously a second step where you need to go. But to, to um, give you a sense, Europe is pretty serious about phasing out its coal. Asia has six times the amount of coal power generation that Europe has, it's six times in Asia. So before we start phasing natural gas out of, out of the global energy system or minimizing it, we first have to go after coal. And there's a big agenda there. And that's why we think that natural gas will be a perfect uh, part of the transition. Um, and, and we see it happen in Ghana, we see it happen in many places, and we certainly hope to see it happen in Kenya as well. It's interesting to me you focused on on the power sector because I think some might say I just want you to quickly respond to it and then go to Mechtild and, and and Cheryl, you know yes we see that need in industry maybe in heating in a place like China but renewables have gotten so cheap batteries have gotten so cheap let's just go right to zero carbon in the power sector how do you respond to that? No, uh, absolutely. Well, uh, apart from the point that Cheryl made about um, about stability, so I absolutely believe in the power sector. Uh, once you get significant penetration of renewables, you're, you're talking about the last 20, 25% of the system that need a stabilizer. Batteries can help, but they really only solve for immediate intermittency. In many places in the world, actually seasonal intermittency is a much bigger deal. And there you either need natural gas or, or over time hydrogen. So I, I agree with you. Industry, of course, much harder to electrify, much harder to decarbonize. So when it comes to making steel or petrochemicals or cement, natural gas will be for quite some time be the low carbon alternative there. And, and we need to push it, push it um, where we can. And I think if we're going to do that, I think there's probably agreement here. We'll need to do things like control uh, methane emissions. And, and I know that I just want to acknowledge that's an area where you've written op-eds and, and I know you've been kind of pushing Brussels to put pretty strong regulations in place on methane. Yeah, no, we could spend the next hour on my convictions about methane, but that is, uh, I'm absolutely firmly of the intent, no methane needs to leak into the atmosphere, and we need regulators and policymakers to take a very firm stance on that in the US, in the EU, but everywhere around the world, and, uh, and it's a cause that I champion with my heart. Cheryl and Mechtild are nodding vigorously, so in agreement, but Cheryl, you wanted to come in. Yes, I, I want to underscore a lot of what Martin said. I think that um, there's still a tremendous amount of coal generation. We're still more than a quarter coal generation, even in the U.S., and a tremendous amount around the world. And there's a great deal of improvement we can still get, even in the substitution for natural gas. It has to be safely extracted. We shouldn't flare it. And methane controls on pipeline and compressor stations are very important. But I don't think we can leave that climate improvement off the list. And even as we decarbonize with completely more deeply decarbonized with more wind, solar, geothermal, and other forms. Um, natural gas can be a balancing fuel for that last 20 to 25 percent now until we get better balancing solutions that are economic and 
workable. I think there's, I go to a lot of conferences where we fight about whether, how we're gonna get that last 20% and it would be a really first class problem to have because in the last year that's available, the United States was 17% renewable. So we have a lot of improvement we can get to build out our wind and solar before we argue about the last bit. We have a long way to go. Thanks. We have, um, I'm going to turn it back to the questions from the audience. Uh, we have a few, one from David Hill, which may be our own David Hill at the Energy Center. Uh, <laughs> it's a common name, but I think it, it is probably. Um, who, who, question for you, Martin, which is that um, you, you note that companies need to do more, and he agrees, uh, but it seems, he says, they'll mainly do it if their investors demand it and if they think they can make money doing it. Investors like BlackRock talk about social responsibility, but I have a feeling their investors still demand high returns. As somebody once told me, no matter what anybody says, it's all about what it's really about is money. And so uh, he's kind of asking about, is this really all about policy and carbon pricing? Uh, and as Andrew said, everything else is, is just uh, academic and what you and any other panelists think is necessary to get people uh, to be willing to pay for something that you know was free yesterday. Yeah, no, it, and uh, I would add uh, uh, Jason um, or David in this sense, let me speak directly to the uh, person asking the question. Um, Yes, you know, understanding um, you know, how the money flows and, and, and delivering returns on investment is absolutely crucial in order to really scale up the energy transition uh, response. I do think eventually capitalism will need to solve the energy transition and that, and that comes with returns and that comes with making sure that, that these investments do attract returns. And that's not a bad thing because these investments are usually made by pension funds or by mutual funds that have the savings and the pensions of world citizens in them. So that, that the, in principle, I, I don't object to that um, uh, to that system. Um, but but indeed, it then comes. So how does that how is that return created? And a carbon price. Uh, you know, we have been arguing for a global price on carbon for the last twenty years. We started in two thousand um, advocating a carbon price. We have a decent one in the EU now. So the ETS after reform that we um, we heavily advocated for is now uh, 25 euros and up on the, depending a bit on the day, which makes a real difference in the, in the system. And other geographies in the world, Canada, New Zealand, California are also working with, uh, with carbon prices and it's, it's, it's coming in, but, but it can't just be about carbon prices. So yes, that needs to uh, grow, but you also need government mandates. Um, um, the implied carbon price for a liter of gasoline in the Netherlands today is more than $200. And still, people use gasoline to um, to put it into the cars, and turn, making that from 200 to 220 dollars doesn't really make a difference. There, you need government mandates. You know, the, the government and the EU has set, has clearly set a mandate to get more penetration of electric vehicles into the system, um, and we get government saying, "Hey, we're going to just outlaw the selling of diesel and petrol diesel and petrol cars by 2035 in the UK, I believe, at the moment." People thinking about 2030. So you need a combination, but absolutely, you will, in some of these uh, parts of the energy transition, you need government mandates or government intervention in terms of carbon pricing in, in order to get the system going. Um, and, and so I, I strongly support it. I don't think the externalities of, of um, the energy transition uh, can be priced in to, into the system by anybody else than strong governments and regulators. You saw obviously a lot of uh, headlines last week with, with BP's new outlook and the idea that peak oil demand is around the corner. Is that a view you share, Martin? Oh, it's, it's certainly a scenario that's possible. Um, I think we would put peak oil into the early 2030s um, as, a, as a base case, but there's certainly a possibility that it never recovers. Um, but, but I think you know, we can get awfully carried away with what is the impact of COVID on the energy transition, but it hasn't changed any of the fundamentals. In, in a way, it's given us a bit of a breathing space of 12 to 24 months where CO2 submissions emissions are down um, for COVID reasons to really plan to build back better. And if we do that well, then maybe we have achieved peak oil. It wouldn't be my base case. I think there's still a lot of oil demand outside of the OECD um, that is going to grow significantly, um, but, but, but it could be. Um, and, uh, and in a way, it would be good if it is. 
except if that goes at the, um, at the expense of the transition being just. So we force peak oil by taking, keeping oil away from the poor people in the world that need it uh, to transport their goods or to go to school, et cetera, then I think we're in the wrong place. Then I think I'd much rather see the developed world going faster and making that energy still available to the people that need it simply to get to a normal quality of life. And the just transition, I think is a very important element of discussion. We haven't had quite the time to discuss yet today, uh, but that's where peak oil is an interesting concept. But as long as it peaks in the West, before it peaks in the um, in the developing world, then I'm then I'm on board. Yeah, no, it's an interesting point, and maybe Andrew, you want to comment on it because there was um, there was another comment from a viewer in Africa um, who, who who just made the comment. It seems as if the panel feels it's okay to leave Africa in the dark until others have made these technologies cost effective. Um, just comment on some of the equity and, and justice issues and, and the, the involved in this transition that Martin just raised. No, I, th I, I think there is no, um, there is no um, problem with what Martin has said. I think what, what, he, what, what he has said is it's, it's, it's a real issue. You know, we, there are a couple of things that we have to, to look at. One, people are going to have get electricity one way or the other. That's what I've been trying to say. The electricity is going to be there. People want to be connected. Uh, people want to have everything everyone else has, TV, the appliances are there, their toasters, microwaves. And you know, electricity is an odd thing. You start off with a light bulb. Uh, before you know it, you've got three, four other appliances in your house. It's just, just generally how it works. It generates its own, its, its own um, demand. The thing is, Jason, you have to create prosperity. So we talked about cars, uh, you know, outlawing petrol and diesel cars by 2030. We are struggling with uh, stopping people from buying cars that are older than eight years. So you can imagine what that does in terms of efficiency, in terms of carbon. So if you, if you build prosperity, then no one wants to drive an old car. But if you don't have prosperity, I can't afford a new car. Yeah? So there's, there's a difference there. People don't drive old cars because they want to. Uh, it's just what is affordable. So the whole issue of how do you build prosperity, and I think we, you asked this question at the beginning of, the, of our discussion, is there a dichotomy between prosperity and climate change? There doesn't have to be. The problem is it's the planning. And I, I, Cheryl, I heard one of your podcasts and you said the problem was, in, like in, for, for example, in California, everyone shut down um, fossil fuels. A and then there was nothing because these things take time. If we're gonna build a power plant, it's gonna take us at least four years. It's gonna take us three years to build it. So we have to plan what it is we're going to do. That's all. The second thing is, yes, do we wait until solar is affordable? No, you don't. I've seen on the continent, many people are starting to build solar, solar plants. It may be expensive. When we started building, it was 12 cents per kilowatt hour. This is what the feed-in tariff was. It's now come down as the technology increases and gets better and more efficient. And the more, the more you have it, the more people want to invest in it. Yeah, we don't want to be like uh, what, uh, what Martin was saying, you know, 28 years and there's no money in hydrogen. You, you know, you want, put it in there. Let's see what happens. Let somebody else invest in it. Uh, but it's not true that um, the panel decides that, you know, Africa should be breathing fresh air in the dark until uh, new technology comes along. Um, I think we have to plan better. I think the financiers have to take this thing seriously. Uh, and from us as policymakers, we're, we're, we're happy to, like I said, you know, go out and get green bonds, go out and encourage people to use solar, give tax, tax rebates on people who use uh, green, green technology for their plants, for their housing. We'll do all that. But there has to be the finance side of it and the technology side of it going together. 
just a, there's a question. Uh, there's only a few minutes left, so I'll get. There's a question here about why switch to gas and not solar instead. But I think I asked a version of that earlier. We talked about it. Quick, uh, quick question. I think Martin. There was a question from uh, Jim Kippers at uh, who is at Siemens, I believe, at least last time I, I talked to him, about when you speak of hydrogen, are you talking about green? So just as mm -hmm. between blue and green, how do you see that? And maybe Mechtel wants to comment on that too. Yeah, I think, well, um, not about gray hydrogen. Um, um, so I think it's about clean hydrogen. Um, I would say with a preference for green, but I don't think we'll scale up the hydrogen business fast enough if we are too picky about blue hydrogen. I do think natural gas plus CCS are perfectly able to give you a clean source of hydrogen. Um, and there's just a lot of it needed. Um, we are now planning to build a 200 megawatt electrolyzer in Rotterdam, which will be the biggest in Europe, uh, 20 times bigger than the current biggest one. Um, that electrolyzer by itself makes enough uh, hydrogen to power 2000 trucks. And that's nothing. 2,000 trucks is a joke. You know, you need to scale. And, and so if you're going to, if you're going to devote all your green electrons to, to uh, making green hydrogen, you can't decarbonize the power sector. So I think blue and green will be needed alongside each other to really allow hydrogen to scale up. Um, uh, and then in the forms of time, uh, we can always decide on what's the best mix. But at the moment, to rule one of the two out, I think will be irresponsible. Mexel, can you comment on that? And then uh, I have another question for you, but just comment on that quickly. <clears throat> oh, I mean, it's easy. I fully agree. There is a lot of talk, certainly in Europe, about green hydrogen. First of all, hydrogen now is basically fossil fuel and gas based. It's 95 percent. So and green hydrogen is quite expensive. So realistically, we need all forms of hydrogen and maybe in the in the longer term uh, future, uh, we need also then to scale up the renewables hydrogen. But in the meantime, we look, need to be open. We need a lot, in, certainly to decarbonize some of our uh, energy intensive industries, some of the transport. So we should be open to all forms of hydrogen. I, I, I would agree. Yeah, we're just, well, we're just running out of time quickly, but um, your colleagues at the IEA, uh, including Fatih, were with us uh, a week or two weeks ago, I think, to present the energy technology perspectives you talked about. And there was one uh, slide in the slide deck, I assume our viewers can find it online, and it was very striking. It was in the scenario to reach net zero emissions by 2050, what technologies are needed? So you, you have a, a, you've modeled out what the IEA thinks it can be. People can quibble with how much it'll be, you know, hydrogen and gas with CCS and all the different technologies. But you have a pathway that in your view is what net zero by 2050 looks like. And if I remember the slide correctly, it said that to get there, here's what it would require. You take the largest solar park that exists in the world today, which I believe is in India. We need to build one of those every two days between now and 2050. You take the largest electrolyzer in the world today, which I think is in Fukushima, and you need to build one of those every hour between now and 2050. And then you take the, well, I don't think it's the largest, but one of the largest, a very large uh, carbon capture project, the Northern Lights Project in the North Sea, you need to build one of those every week between now and 2050. So my question for you coming back to what Andrew said in the beginning is, are we taking this problem seriously? And do we understand the scale and the challenge of what it takes to meet the Paris climate goals? Uh, so thank you. I, I presented the ETP a few times and last week also in Japan and exactly this slide gets most of the attention. So uh, I think it's it's there to illustrate. I mean, we, we have put a lot of efforts in our sustainable development scenario where there's already half of the or one third of the technologies are in early stages. But that would bring us to net zero late 60s, 70. So we made this fast innovation case to bring innovation down 20 years and have a deeper cut in emissions. And the result is what you say that some of our key technologies, hydrogen, solar, and CCS, in, needs an incredible speed. But on the other side, um, it's very good to illustrate. I think we should be aware um, how things are done and the Northern Lights, which took years to be built. If we want to scale that up, it, it needs to be done. There are two things to be 
taken into account. It's there to illustrate, but there will be technology and cost reductions. I mean, looking backwards, we saw so many changes speeding up. So obviously this, this should happen as well. And this scenario doesn't include behavioral change. So in my team in 13th of October, we come out with the next World Energy Outlook 2020. And there we will also have a net zero, which includes behavioral change. So uh, I think it's, it's excellent to focus on technology, innovation, what is needed uh, to decarbonize, in particular the industry sector and uh, transport, as we say, the power uh, um, is, is, another, is, is, is a faster example. But we, we, I think we should look at it as ambitious as it is, but it's good that this slide catches too much attention uh, because we worked very hard to calculate and we were all inside uh, quite shocked about the results. But as I say, it's, there's, Andrew said it in the beginning, there's a lot of talks, uh, let's do it and let's see what it needs to be done. And this is one way to illustrate that. Well, it's an excellent report. Thanks for the IA's work on it. And thanks to all of you for being with us for this fascinating discussion today. I wish we had many more hours to talk about this. Um, so uh, as, as I mentioned, the full video recording of this event will be available on our website in a few days. And we will have the chance, not with these brilliant four people, but uh, to continue these conversations throughout the course of Climate Week uh, NYC. We have a, a number of events at the Center on Global Energy Policy. The series will continue tomorrow with a discussion on, on, on a related topic. I mean, uh, the green recovery from COVID-19 uh, with uh, Mayor Eric Garcetti of Los Angeles, uh, Damalola Ogenby, the new head of sustainable energy for all, Commissioner Kadri Simpson, the EU Commissioner for Energy in the European Commission, and our own uh, Mauricio Cardenas at the Center on Global Energy Policy, the former Energy uh, and Finance Minister of Colombia. Uh, that will be followed later in the week with events addressing food and climate change, environmental justice, energy innovation, and our new Energizing America report, and much more for a full schedule of all Climate Week events. Please visit us online at energypolicy.columbia.edu. Uh, please join me in thanking virtually, in thanking uh, the, the, these great panelists for a fascinating discussion. Thanks for being with us today. Enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.